useful interaction with the creationist. Many years ago, I taught for a year or a little bit less in the University of Botswana in Southern Africa, which is a very nice country um, and very well organized, good education system, a profoundly Christian country, Presbyterian, um, lots of Scottish Presbyterian influence there. And I knew there was a lot of literal uh, belief in the Bible. And I taught a few lectures about human evolution. And at the end, I asked one of the students, how did he reconcile what I'd been telling him, that humans appeared on Earth 150,000 or so years ago, with his belief that it all happened instantly about 6,000 years before the present? And he looked me straight in the eye, and he gave me the perfect answer. He said, sir, it's very simple. You evolved. We were created. <laughs> and I'm very happy with that argument. Um, but let me tell you why I think um, um, we evolved. There have been uh, various uh, mutations of the creationist argument to do with intelligent design, which I don't particularly intend to talk about in this lecture because I simply haven't got time. Um, but uh, I am going to talk about some of the uh, facts which now tell us that we did evolve and were not created. One of the big worries, it seems to me, of the creationist movement is the way that somehow, to them, evolution demeans human beings. It makes them only just part of the animal kingdom. Um, that notion was picked up immediately after 1859 where people began to get somewhat worried about the facts of evolution. Here's a, uh, a cartoon from Punch um, from 1861, two years after the origin, where the horrible event happens of a chimp in a dinner jacket comes in and has to be, has to be um, served by a human being. The argument being that really it was rather demeaning to consider ourselves as simply another ape. Well, actually, I agree with that argument. I think it's both demeaning and wrong to consider ourselves as simply another ape, and I shall return to that at the end of the, um, of the, uh, of the lecture. There is now, however, a strong feeling that we're just another ape. Here's Jane Goodall, who's the uh, very famous, and rightly so, um, behavioral biologist, doing something which really is not at all a wise thing to do, which is kissing a chimpanzee, and quite why it's unwise, I'll come to in a moment. Um, but Jane Goodall is one of the many biologists out there who work on chimpanzees and primates, who say, first of all, that actually we should change our Latin name, or their Latin name, to be homo, so they're They'll be homo paniscus rather than pan paniscus. And indeed, some people say, they have human rights because they are so close to ourselves. Well, to me, actually, that's a new form of creationism. That's, a, that's taking biology too far. That's a belief which can't be tested. But let's look at what can be, the facts that can be tested. Why are we so certain that evolution is true? Why, for that matter, are we so certain that the Earth goes around the sun? Well, we know, of course, that we have satellite pictures and the like, which, uh, which tell us that's the case. But why did Galileo think that? Actually, his proof was rather subtle. It had to do with the presence of two kinds of stars in the sky, what we might call, what he called wandering stars, we now call planets, um, and what he called fixed stars, which seem to stay in the, roughly in the same place. The only way he could make sense of that was to say that we were a wandering star, a planet that went round a fixed star, the sun. Now, I think most people who believe in that the solar system, most of the public, don't actually know that that's true. Uh, that was Galileo's argument. So why then did Darwin come to the notion of evolution? It actually ca came... It, his first uh, idea was sketched in 1837. Sketched actually on the site of a building in University College London, now an extremely squalid 1950s horror, um, but then Charles Darwin's house, and he sketched this little tree. Um, and I keep trying to get them to paint it on the walls of the biology building, but it constantly doesn't get done. But the notion he had was what he called descent with modification, that you could have um, a line, a sort of family tree, which united different creatures, and from an origin, perhaps number one or, or number A, you might actually get slow, gradual change, which over many, many years would, would um, give rise to new forms of life. He got that idea from somewhere rather... Um, unexpected. His idea was descent with modification. Descent, passing on information, biological information, from generation to generation. Modification, that passage was imperfect. And it was imperfect because of what we now call mutation. The message wasn't copied exactly. It's a very simple definition of what uh, evolution is. We can make an even simpler one today. Evolution is genetics plus time. 
Darwin got the idea, and you can see it in his autobiography, um, in part from one of the very few famous Joneses in history, not Steve, jo not Steve Jones, the lead guitarist of the Sex Pistols, but Sir William Jones, who was a merchant in London in the 18th century. And when he was a young man, William Jones discovered that he had the quite extraordinary facility with language. In his teenage years, he could speak all the languages of Europe, including, of course, Latin and Greek, which everybody educated would have to speak in those days. Um, he quickly learned Hebrew, Russian, and the like. He then was sent to India, and he began to learn Indian languages. And he saw something very startling to him, which was there was a clear relationship between the various uh, languages we have in Europe and certain languages in India. And he suggested that, in fact, they sprang from a common root, that there was descent with modification. You can see uh, particular words in English, 2, 3, 7, 10, uh, Latin and Greek, very similar, but an extinct language of northern India, Sanskrit, um, spoken last at least a thousand years ago, Dvatraya Saptadasa, clearly some generic relationship to the words in um, to the words in English. And what William Jones did was to draw the first evolutionary tree which showed the patterns of descent of words like father. Here are the words in Italian, Spanish, and so on, padre, padre, per, um, de descending from the Latin pater, which is close to the Sanskrit pater, and what William Jones was able to do was to reconstruct an extinct language which must have been the ancestor of them all. And that language has now been reconstructed in some detail. It's called Pi, or Proto-Indo-European. It's supposed to have been spoken initially in a small part of the Caucasus and spread to the east and west, and people have conferences where they talk Pi to each other, and it all sounds very peculiar. Um, uh, and it's a family tree. And you can do a lot with linguistics. Uh, you can actually make the rather daring assumption that languages change at a regular rate. And it's clear that uh, some languages are quite closely related. I think Diderot was the man who said English is only French badly pronounced. Um, if you hear my French, you'll probably hit, agree that he was right. And you can make trees which actually show... Yeah. Ah, damn, sorry. Uh, you, can make, you, can make tr you, can, you can see that process actually happening in front of your eyes. Here's a recording of a young lady. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your home and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister, Margaret Rose, and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. We know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, Remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. That was, I'm sure you realize, the Queen, uh, when she was about 16 in 1941, um, addressing, Lilibet addresses the children of Britain, and it seems appropriate to pay it in this, her house, and uh, so close to her 80th birthday. That was English as she was spoke in the 1940s. Um, sounds pretty harmonious to me. This is a descendant of that lady. Lesotho is obviously something that is very close to my heart and something that I want to carry on with. Um, and once I leave Sandhurst, then I'll be able to make the decision of whether I can do both at the same time or whether I need to think, hang on, army, right, that's one thing that I'm going to do. That's something I want to do, and it's something that I may have to say yes to for a bit and then stop and then carry on with what you know, I should be doing. And it's a difficult one, what I should be doing, what I want to be doing. You know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> That's Prince.